Marty Kagan is the author of Inspired, How to Create Tech Products Customers Love and Empowered Ordinary People, Extraordinary Products. He has performed and managed virtually all of the roles in modern tech product organization, including product management, software development, product marketing, user experience design, software testing, engineering management, and executive management. He's the founder of the Silicon Valley Product Group, where he helps others create successful products through his writing, speaking, advising, and coaching. Marty has served as an executive responsible for defining and building products for some of the most advanced companies in the world, including Hewlett Packard, Netscape Communications, and eBay. Marty, welcome to the Dexagility Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me. So, Marty, one of the things that I really noticed in the book Empowered, at the very start of the book, you acknowledged uh, Bill Campbell, uh, who was featured in Trillion Dollar Coach. You mentioned you weren't coached by him yourself, but you got to meet him quite a bit. And for the listeners out there who are curious what Bill was like, what what was your sense of the guy? Well, uh, he's a little bit a uh, different kind of person to describe because he's one of those people, his, his, uh, the experience in person was so unusual that I, I, I find it's a little, it's a little challenging to describe. It, it almost sounds corny. If anybody else was to say the things he did, uh, I think it might sound corny, but from him, it was very authentic. He was, uh, I think more than anybody I think I've ever met. He seemed to genuinely love people and especially good people. And if he, uh, I think if he felt you were trying to do the right thing and wanted help, it seemed to me he would never say no. He was just one of those people that was genuinely interested in all the people. I, I, I genuinely wished I was coached by him because I felt like those people had not just a coach, but like one of your best friends. And in fact, the people I know that were coached directly by him, um, they they definitely considered him a, a very close more more than a coach or mentor, but really a true you know partner in professional life and personal life probably. Uh, he he came across really well in Trillion Dollar Coach. What really struck me was the weekend report. So Monday morning, say the the team would get together and they'd meet for an hour, and they might spend fifty minutes of that meeting talking about what people did for the weekend really getting to know people and same with one-to-ones as well. You'd, you'd almost think from the way it came across in the book that you were there to talk about personal stuff. And then the last few minutes, just talk about business, just like that. Yeah. Well, I remember coaching is yet another thing I probably learned uh, from him indirectly, but uh, coaching is predicated on trust. You really can't have the kind of interactions and the kind of honest, constructive candor uh, that you need if you don't have trust. And I think that was his way of establishing that foundation of trust. Thank you very much. Um, I noticed that Chris Jones is uh, the co-author for the latest book. And I gather Chris is one of the fellow partners in the Silicon Valley uh, product group. Can you tell us a little bit more about Chris? Yeah, sure. Chris was actually the uh, first partner I brought on to help me with the product side. I had another partner too, Martina Luchenko, but she was doing the product marketing side. She's been, she was actually the original or the second partner at SVPG. But Chris came on to help on the product side. I've known him for 25 years, longtime head of product at Symantec and several other companies. And he had developed a terrific reputation as a coach, as a uh, product thinker. And Chris has actually served as my, I've been writing really from as soon as I started SVPG. And anytime you write fiction, uh, sorry, nonfiction, I think it's really critical that you have someone you can trust to be your expert reviewer, somebody that you know knows everything, every detail. And, and is, but then further is willing to really tell you when something is not good. And Chris has been that person for me for uh, really as long as I've been doing this. And what had happened was the first two books I wrote, I was the only author. But for this third book, I invited Chris to be my co-author because 
Uh, first of all, there was a lot of hard content in this book. There's a lot of difficult topics. These are not, you know, fluffy business school topics. These are hard topics. And I thought, Chris, if I made him co-author, it would be like having an expert reviewer right there by your side, you know, almost in a pair programming sense. You really have somebody expert who you could lean on. And, uh, and that worked out really well. I know a lot of other authors that have not had good experiences as co-authors, but we had a very good experience. And I think it's because First of all, we had known each other for many years, and he had already served in that expert reviewer role, but also because we talked about it. We talked about what we wanted in a book and how that was different than our other work, and we believed that each of us should 100% agree in the truth of every sentence. If we didn't, we would argue about it and decide, but only include what we really both believed was true. And, uh, you know, I think that's important if you're going to have a co-author. And, and by the way, not just for the book, I'm, I, on all my, all my writing, if it's even remotely possible that it's going to be uh, controversial or, you know, question of, I, I don't feel 100% confident it's correct. I always, even to this day, have him review it first. That reminds me of something you mentioned a few times during the book Empowered, you talked about the written narrative and you talked about it for a number of purposes, uh, getting ready for a presentation, uh, maybe I guess writing a blog post, you got some ideas, some initiative that might help your customers or end users. And you mentioned that Amazon were using it quite a bit. Is that the kind of approach that you also used uh, when you writing the book or is a book a kind of a different project? No, that's actually, first of all, I have been a fan of that technique for most of my career. Amazon didn't invent the written narrative. Of course, it's been around as long as anything, but Amazon embraced it and probably focused on it more than any other large company I know. They actually banned PowerPoint. So they are going further than just the statement. And anyway, uh, I've been a fan of that forever. And that is very much what I you know, when you're writing something hard or when you're trying to communicate a hard concept, it's very easy on Twitter just to say something, you know, a little sound bite, and, you know, nobody's going to really get into it. There's no nuance in Twitter. But even on a PowerPoint presentation, you know, you just sort of wave your hands. And if you sound like you know what you're talking about, people kind of go along. But when you write something out and it has to stand on its own, there is nowhere for the author to hide. It is laying out right there your evidence, your argument, your conclusion. And the truth is, you know, when you write something like that, that a knowledgeable reader will know right away if you know what you're talking about or not. And so there is something very vulnerable and telling about these written narratives. And in fact, I don't talk about this that much, but it's not a secret when when I write, and for the book was a, this the latest example, each chapter started as an article on my blog. And I do that because it forces this issue. So I'm able to write the concept down. I first have my Chris review it <laughs> to mm. me. And first of all, even I review it, iterate several times, but then I have Chris review it. And when I'm feeling pretty good about it, I put it on the blog. And then tens of thousands of people are reading it. And I, you know, sometimes people love it. Sometimes they don't seem to get it at all. Sometimes they ask a lot of the same follow-up questions. And I realize I should have anticipated those questions. And so I'll iterate on that. But every blog article is an MVP for a literal MVP for a potential chapter in a book. And if you look at the original article, if you look at the corresponding chapter in the book, you can see how it's evolved. Uh, not, and it's not just editing either. Obviously, the book version is better grammar. <laughs> it's uh, more concise. But it also addresses more of the questions proactively. And frankly, things that didn't really contribute to the argument, I get rid of. So the versions are much better, I think, in the book, obviously, than in the article. But the articles on the blog serve a major purpose because when you think about it, and stop me if I'm going too deep into the art of publishing, but if you think about it, 
Uh, this is true with any product, including uh, a topic in a book. You want to, first of all, make sure that the article is valuable, right? People find real value. If it doesn't do that, what's the point of the whole thing? So to me, that's the most important. And that's true with any product. Second, you want to make sure that it's usable. What that means in, a, in an article is that people can actually understand your argument. Uh, and that's not so easy, actually. They have to be able to follow your argument. And the third is it has to be feasible. And for a book, that means, all right, you know, I, my current, I'm writing an article right now today, and I hope to publish it today or tomorrow. And I was worried that that might have been too big for one article. In fact, it was combined with a previous article, and I broke it up. Feasible-wise, it was too big for one article, too many topics for one. So uh, that, and then the most important one besides value is really, is that article viable? What that means is, first of all, is it correct? <laughs> is it accurate? Is it defensible? Is it ethical? Is it consistent with the brand? I mean, everything I write is part of SVPG. So there is a brand we represent. I want to write about things that are, uh, re you know, that support that brand. I'm not going to go write about politics or I'm not going to go write about other things. I'm going to, people have learned to trust that at SVPG, there are certain things we write about and nothing else. And so I want to make sure it's consistent with that. That's what these MVPs let us do is figure out if this article is good. And I, I, um, I've always, yeah, I do read a lot of books and I love reading, actually. I love books, but most books I read, you know, are not very impressive. I think most books out there are not very impressive. In fact, the classic problem with business books to me is I read the book and I'm going, damn, that should have just been an article. <laughs> there was hardly any meat there, right? It was hardly any substance there. And somebody just stretched it into a book, which, you know, they turn a 20 page article into a 300 page book. And I, my view is I want people to have the opposite opinion. I want them to say, wow, every chapter could have been its own book. There was so much substance there. Now, that sounds great, but the way I do that is this process. The way I do it is I make sure that every single chapter can carry its own weight. With those four risk uh, That's right. factors. Okay. And would that be the structure of your written narrative as well, Marty, or do you... Do you like whatever what Amazon does or whatever the original people did with that written narrative? Do you have a favorite structure for a written narrative? Like what would be the big headings in there for you? Yeah, well, it depends. See, this is why there are many variations of a written narrative. Yeah. Uh, many variations. Uh, uh, these articles are absolutely written narratives. Now, they're generally a little, sp I mean, I'm close. The general guideline is a 20 minute read, which is a six page document in general for most yeah. people. And that's just a guideline. The most famous, I mean, there's several variations of a, of a six pager written narrative that are popular. The one Amazon is most famous for is part of the working backwards process. You may have heard of that. It's, mm. it's all focused on outcome. And, it's, uh, and the idea is you start with a press release. So the first two pages of that six pages, a press release, the back four pages are a set of questions and answers. You're anticipating the objections, you're writing down your response. It's a great example of a written narrative. But there are many other examples or formats for written narratives. And of course, they all have their own headings because they're all. <laughs> so for example, I love doing them for product strategy. It's to me, it's a really good way of, of getting your thoughts in order for a product strategy. And so a product strategy has sort of one set of headings. Uh, a, a PR FAQ has a different set of headings. And then of course, if you're writing an article or if you're doing a talk, when I do a, a keynote talk, I like to do a written narrative first because I know that way I will get my arguments solid. You know, every, I, I think most people have this sort of fear. You're going to get up in front of a big group and you're not going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and people will see that you're, you know, don't know what you're talking about. I mean, that's a fear that I've always had. And so to me, I don't want that to happen. So what do I do? I do a written narrative to make sure that that's not the case. I show it to people like Chris, but I have others too that I trust will absolutely tell me if this argument is not holding water. And I know that, by the way, because they often have told me <laughs> that this article, this argument is weak. Uh, 
Chris tells me that all the time. He's like, this article has got all these holes. Let me list all the holes. <laughs> and he's not afraid to tell me that. And I think about it. And you have to realize, I wouldn't send it to him if I didn't think it was decent. But yeah. he spots these holes. And, you know, as soon as he says it, I'm like, oh, of course he's right. Yeah. And I need yeah. to go fix it. But that's the process. By the time i am got a written narrative done, first of all, it's very easy then to do a good presentation because your, your argument is oh, solid. Structures. Yeah. Yes. But also, I feel like I can get in front of anybody. I don't care how smart the company is. I can get in front of anybody because I've done my preparation. I think there's a little bit of uh, storytelling skill there as well, isn't there? You have a very, I listened to the, your two most recent books and your ability to tell a story is quite compelling. Like one of the things that really struck me was um, you talked about the 737 MAX crisis, right? And the way they outsourced to, I don't know, probably just some feature factory or something like that and you know, yeah. outputs and no outcomes. And then you said something really, really struck me. I was driving my own car at the time, but it was uh, a Tesla improves all the time. I was like, wow. <laughs> that really, really struck me. You know, like, these kind of one-liners that uh, you managed to get in there. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean by first, most important is it's really got to be valuable what you're saying, but you have to say it in a way that people really grok. And honestly, that's the storytelling. And I find you have to iterate a lot. You know, people sometimes diminish it. They say it's just wordsmithing, <laughs> but it's really not. You're really trying to come up with the words that resonate with people. And because uh, if it resonates and they're like, oh, man, I, I'm going to remember that line. I'm going to really that's going to stick in my head. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, that really uh, rings a bell for me. I wanted to talk to you about the, the start of the book where you went into feature factories. And it's not even a case of having a bad product strategy, but there's no product strategy and really just features and projects. And um, you talk about feature teams. I think what you meant was essentially just delivering stuff and really not uh, teams are empowered and also probably a lack of skill in the team because you, you talked quite a lot in the book about um, having a tech lead, for example, for being top of the engineering side, the product designer in terms of is this usable, is this fixing the right problems and so on, and the product manager and, and how decisions uh, were made. And... Last week, for example, you, I'm not sure it was the last week or not, you wrote that uh, CSPO pathology article, which is really a very popular, I've noticed. How, how do you think that organizations can move away from that pathology where they've got product owners who actually aren't skilled in product management and they've learned how to become product owners in some kind of feature factory? How do, is there a way out of jail for people like that? Uh, do you have any suggestions for people in that situation? Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. It, now, it's complicated. And yeah. there are really two big things in what you just said. So it's yeah. worth calling them out. Yeah. Even companies that don't have the CSPO pathology. In truth, it's mostly a problem. The CSPO issue is mostly a European problem. It's not that it's nowhere else in the world, but it's really big problem in Europe. And we can kind of talk about why if you want to. I have some theories, but okay. all I know is in most good places, I mean, in China and in Brazil and in India, it's not even a discussion. They're, they know product management is very different. But your first topic is really, yeah, there's a lot of these feature factories that are basically just there to crank out features on a roadmap. And that's just output. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, we, you mentioned skill involved. There's still skill required to design and code features. It might not be their hu true human potential, but it's still some skill required. Mm -hmm. It is, though, true that there are much more skills and tougher skills required for a real product team. Because in a real product team, you're not given a roadmap of features that you're held, told to get out on time on budget. You're given a set of problems to solve. And you have to figure out as a team the best way to solve those problems. Now, that still requires design skills. It still requires engineering skills, but really more of both of them. Because, for example, I mean, we could talk about either of them. 
for a designer, if I just tell you, we've added this payment method, I need you to design a wire, a wire, a workflow, wireframes that have that payment method. Okay, good designers will do a good job at that. But if I tell you what we really have to do is improve conversion rate, you help me figure out the best way to do that. That really takes design skills. Mm. And similarly, and I would argue even more true, is engineering. Uh, I have for a long time, I've tried to explain to executives that if you're just using your engineers to code, you're only getting about half their value. And that's the difference. On a feature team, they're there to code. If an engineer says, what a stupid feature we're building today, do you think anybody cares? They, they, it's already been committed. It's promised. It's like, I don't care. Just build it. If you want your paycheck at the end of the week, build it. But on the empowered product team, it's totally not like that. The engineers are given the problem, just like the designer and product manager. And the engineers are able to figure out, well, how should we solve this? What is the best way to do this? Should we build this feature? Or maybe it's not that at all. Maybe we should redesign this. Maybe we should look at performance. Maybe, who knows? And the, the reason this is so important is because consistently, the best single source of innovation are engineers. Now, that is not true on a feature team. It's not that they couldn't be the source. It's true. It's just that they're not even, they're not even consulted. They're not even invited to the party. They're just there to build the features on the roadmap. On the other hand, in an empowered product team, they are paid not just to code scalable solutions, but they're paid to help figure out the best solution to the problem. And that literally is where uh, innovation comes from. And you can pick any of your favorite products. <laughs> I'm pretty sure certainly any of my favorite products, whether it's iPhones or Shopify or Stripe or Spotify or Peloton or an Alexa device, all of these it was engineers that made that happen. It was engineers that figure out the way to do that. And so an empowered product team has engineers and designers stepping up and really using their skills. Now, there's another third leg of the stool, which is the part that's just totally missed by all the you know, sort of CSPO nonsense. And that is a real product manager needs to be responsible for the value and the viability of the solution. Remember, you're not given the solution like you are on a roadmap. You're given a problem. And the product, while designer, they're responsible that it's usable and the engineers that it's feasible. It's the product manager that's responsible that it's valuable and viable. And anybody who's ever done product, a real product in a product company will tell you that is very hard. That's really what a startup founder does, in fact, value and viability. Making something that your customers actually want to buy or choose to use and then coming up with a solution that's truly viable for your business, that means that the product manager needs to understand how your product goes to market, the marketing, the sales, the costs, how you fund the product, how you monetize the product, what are the legal issues, what are the compliance issues, what are the privacy issues, this is the job of a product manager. If you don't have somebody on the team that can do that, then the team basically can only thrash at solutions and hope some group of executives will make a decision. Yeah, you talked quite a bit in the book about when a new product manager joins, investing maybe half a day every day for two to three months, learning about legal, about finance, meeting customers, maybe three customer visits a week, really understanding what's going on so they're not vulnerable to that situation where you get the hippo type uh, prioritization going on because they haven't actually structured their brief maybe with a written narrative and they haven't actually learned enough to, to be a decent product manager. Well, realistically, engineers and designers, they know if their product manager is able to contribute to the team the way they need to, they know. If they're just a backlog administrator, they're like, geez, we could do that. If they're just a project manager, they're like, we could do that. You don't need to be here. I'd rather have another engineer on the team. On the other hand, if the product manager has done their homework, like we're talking about, hmm. those are skills. Those, that's knowledge that the designer doesn't have and the engineers don't have. And the designer and engineers need that in order to come up with a good solution. So you, one really easy, I'll give you a little 
one of those shortcuts uh, you could tell. If you're in a company and, and you ask them to define what a product manager does, if they give you this long-winded hem and haw, you know, about all these, oh, well, they're generalists or they kind of herd the cats or they're just, all you're hearing is a feature team product manager, which is really a project manager. And on the other hand, if you ask, what do you do? And they say, well, I'm responsible for value and viability. That's what I bring to the team. Short, that's all. That's what they do. You know, okay, well, this is a person that actually understands what a product team is and what understand what their job is. And so then it would be the, pro the product designer would look after usability then, I'm guessing. And then yeah, the now, engineer feasibility, right? That's right. Although it's really important to point out that just like I said, good engineers, they know not only the best way to build something, but they know what's possible out there. They will contribute ideas that help with value all the time. Same is true with designers. Good designers, not when they really get inside the heads of the users, they understand the experience that you need to provide. They will often have insights around value too. So a good product team is getting everybody really together. And I'm not saying that to be politically correct. A good product team has to solve problems together because those are three very different skill sets you're bringing to the table. I noticed something as well. You talked about ineffective boards in some companies as well. So sometimes what's happening, you got this board, board members in the company, and they're, they're kind of influencing the CEO in terms of what decisions she should be making. And, you know, shouldn't we be outsourcing the crown jewels and all this kind of rubbish? But you made a very interesting comment about having a CIO versus a CTO. And I've seen that myself as well. But I'd love you to explain to the listeners why you think sometimes it's better having a CTO as opposed to a CIO when, you're, when you've got a, a tech product and you really want to deliver value to the market. Well, first of all, it's worth pointing out in a, in a modern tech company, it wouldn't even be a question. This would just be a CTO. Mm -hmm. And in fact, under the CTO is usually far down a small organization that is run by a CIO. And mm -hmm. this person is re responsible for the internal systems. But realize in a lot of the world outside of the, you know, the real tech powered industry, uh, they don't have that. They have a CIO. And the reason this is often a problem is the CIO is literally there to serve the business. That's yeah. what they're there for. But a CTO is not. A CTO is there to serve customers Should in ways it. that work for the business. It's very fundamentally different. And in fact, one of the things I struggled with, and I'm not, I mean, for more than 20 years, is the CIO that really resists changing. And sometimes I've had to go to the CEO and say, look, you're never going to change with that CIO as your leader. You're just never going to change. That person has exactly the wrong mindset, exactly the wrong attitude. And other times I'm like, you just need to uh, be very clear that that's not the job anymore. It's a very different job. It's really the difference between Boeing and Tesla right there, how they view the role of technology. Realize one of the telltale signs of a company that does not understand the role of technology is that they view the te technology as a cost center mm. and hence IT. On the other hand, in a good product company, they would laugh at that and they would say, no, software is a profit center. <laughs> it's the core of our business. That is what's powering our customers' experiences. It's not a cost center. Um, it's a profit center. It is a core enabler. And that's such a radical difference. That difference is personified in many companies by the difference between a CTO and a C CIO. One of the things I noticed in the Inspired book is you focused on uh, what a good product manager does. And, and then what you talk about Empowered is, uh, well, it's more aimed at product leaders as far as I understand it. But you also kind of went into a fair bit of depth, but by necessity, I guess, to explain what kind of support a product leader needs to provide to, you know, to basically have an environment where you can have really good product management going on. That's right. What I wanted to do, I mean, if I step back for a second, I'll tell you what really yeah. the, that what happened was yeah. uh, inspired, especially when I did the second edition a couple of years ago, 
that really spread far beyond my little bubble in Silicon Valley. And uh, what happened was I met so many teams and in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America, everywhere that, um, that said, yes, they want to work like this. They understand it. They see it's what they need to do. But what I realized was their leaders weren't letting them work like that. The leaders were literally preventing it most of the time just because they didn't know. And I realized it's not enough to share the techniques of the best product teams. You also have to share the techniques of leadership. And so I would meet companies and the problem was the leaders were, okay, now I understand we need to change, but I've never worked like this. How am I supposed to teach my people how to work like this if I've never worked like this? right? This is one of those same issues I have with CSPO and PSPO programs. The people that are teaching them have no clue what they're teaching about. It's the same problem, the blind leading the blind. And so, I needed to provide a lot of details on, I'm like, okay, here's what you need to be coaching your people on. You can learn this stuff together. And in fact, it's the biggest single section. There's 10 sections in the book, empowered, it's by far the biggest single section is coaching because that is literally the number one responsibility of the managers. Yeah. You spent a lot of time going through coaching and it was really good. You talked about coaching product managers, helping them to be better, uh, also helping in situations where they're struggling, uh, having regular one-on-one conversations, not surprising people at performance reviews and uh, so that was really, really nice. And uh, when did you basically start doing coaching, I guess? That's well, it's a little embarrassing to admit. I The first 10 years of my career was as an engineer. I was at HP Labs. And that was my first exposure to work. Re- I mean, real job, right? <laughs> I went right from college to uh, this job. And um, every single day for those 10 years, I had at least one manager that was specifically uh, responsible for coaching me to be better at my job. And I thought everybody had that. I thought that was just how our industry worked. I thought that until after at 10 years, I left to do a startup and then I joined Netscape and I was in the more of the real world. And then I am to this day, I meet people that have been, in the product space, either an engineer, a designer, a product manager for 10 years, and they've literally never had anybody coach them. Sometimes they'll say they had somebody mentor them, but of course, mentoring is nothing compared to coaching. Better than nothing? Sure, but not much better than nothing. A coaching is very specific, and I realized that this is not true in a lot of companies. Now, it is true in all the best companies, and really, I think uh, you can trace a lot of that belief in the power of coaching to Bill Campbell. Mm-hmm. He he literally did instill in both you know in the founders of Apple, Google, and Amazon, just three major examples, the importance of coaching. There are a set of companies, and I think it's not coincidental, the best companies in the world that believe very heavily in coaching. And then there's so many others where if you ask a manager what you know, is coaching one of your responsibilities? They'll usually say, not really, or way down the list. And so this requires an intervention. This requires often I have to sit them down and say, no, Uh, if you want to be a good company, you need to make this your number one responsibility. And sometimes they're shocked. I mean, especially when I show them the number of hours that they need to spend. But one of the things I tell them, and I tell them I am also telling this to your CEO, is that you should judge your head of product by their weakest product manager. Ooh. Okay. And they, that is true, too. I mean, they, are, they should be judging it by your weakest product manager. So you are the one responsible and accountable for making sure that you don't have weak product managers or weak designers, or weak engineers. In truth, the problem is not as bad for engineers and designers as it is for product managers because of some of these other issues we've been alluding to. But for product managers especially, there's a real crisis in our industry when you get outside of the good product companies. 
And the people that they have in that role are just hugely underpowered for that responsibility. Now, you pointed out a lot of them are feature teams, so who cares? Because they don't need those skills really anyway. But the truth is, most of those companies do want to change. But the prerequisite for changing is to raise the bar on these product managers. Indeed. And, and even just caring about outcomes as well. Some oh, companies yeah. are making so much money, they're just throwing stuff at the wall and they don't know what's working, actually. So, no, and, and the outcome... You know, that is a sign of a good product team, but yeah. uh, mostly companies just talk about it, but they don't really embrace it. Yeah. Talking to customers, looking at the data. I, I remember I keep telling people that I coach uh, about the one liner from the Inspired book, which was a good product manager spends one to one and a half hours per day looking at the analytics, looking at the data, understanding what's going on. That was really powerful. And so a lot, of, a lot of the problem with, the, with a lot of these feature factories as well is that you've got people in the role who actually, uh, they don't have the power, they're the opposite of empowered in the title of your book there. Uh, they've been kind of substituted in because someone needs to tick that box. Right. Um, it's usually a business analyst or it's yeah, a uh, yeah. project manager or yeah. just anybody who will take a simple CSPO class. Yeah. Whereas what I would, what I prefer in, in in your model would be you'd have you'd, you'd have a, a a product manager who really really understands what's going on. They actually do have a big say. Uh, that they, they you know they don't even have to be with the team uh, a lot of the time if they can really come up with quick decisions. I love the synchrony that you talked about between the tech lead, the product designer, and the product manager in terms of ensuring that we're kind of making the right decisions. But I'd rather someone who had more power and was slightly less available than kind of just tick the box uh, kind of product manager. I'm curious how you manage that. So, like you know, if you're if you're if you got a, if you're saying a, pro a product leader uh, should be measured by the weakest product manager that they have, and these people don't grow on trees. You did talk about the Google Academy. I think it was uh, some kind of a product manager academy and boot camp you talked about as well. How do you how do you make how do you make that happen, or how do you help, help organizations to make sure that they really do have good product managers? Well, the the one word answer is coaching. Mm. That's the the one word answer. That's why it's the most important responsibility. Of course, and in a good company, that is how it's done. You, you go work for somebody, and their primary job is to coach you. Now, if that manager doesn't know what good looks like which is kind of the problem we're getting at here. If the manager does know what good looks like, then this is their primary responsibility mm. and they literally need to be held accountable to that. But if the manager doesn't, then there's a couple options. One is, uh, first of all, they need to learn as fast as possible. So they need to make that a priority. But in the interim, they can get, there are executive product coaches that will help you, that are proven product leaders that will help you come up to speed yourself and at the same time, raise the skill level of your team. There are coaches uh, around the world that do that. There aren't that many, at least that many that I know, but they are, they do exist in most parts of the world. I try to keep a little informal directory uh, uh, of the people I know so that I could recommend them. That's the, uh, that's, important. And then, of course, you can get your people trained. But that's difficult when uh, the problem we have is that the manager doesn't even know what to look for in training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. one of the things I've been trying to share is how do you find somebody who's competent to actually train your people? And that if the minimum the manager could do is that, it's not that hard to do your homework and make sure the person teaching is actually someone that's been there, done that at a good product company. It, and that's not a very high bar if you think about it. <laughs> that's not too much to ask. Yet the majority of people training in our industry, I just mean in our industry worldwide, have never been there, done that at a good product company. In fact, most of them have only worked at feature team companies. And so this is, a, this is why I think our problem is going from bad to worse rather than gradually getting better. It's because we've kind of institutionalized these bad behaviors. And yeah, that's why my last article tried to call this out, the, uh, the, the institutionalizing of uh, people confusing a process 
for delivery with a major job on a product team. There was, I noticed there were three qualities I think that you looked for in people, integrity, dependability, and accountability. So you know, I'd take that as a, maybe a, as a given. But then when you asked people to, you know, to say, you know, what was their weakest of the following four, execution, creativity, strategy, or growth, that was your, kind of your way of like telling, telling you about pe- their weaknesses so that maybe you can figure out where, where the opportunity is. Um, is that something that you help companies to understand that zoning in on those four areas might help you to understand where the weaknesses are in our product management? Well, the first thing I'd say is if you believe coaching is your primary responsibility, then a lot of what we shared is ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And it kind of starts by assessing the person. And there are many ways. In fact, the Empowered Book shared several different frameworks for assessing people. One is these characteristics you're describing. Another one was the rubric on the specific skills. And the idea is that one way or another, evaluate the people, figure out where they are. When I, I I mean, I'll I'll just be, I'm going to share my situation because you can see how common it really is. Mm -hmm. I was an engineer and actually I had become an engineering manager at the time, but I really wanted to learn product because I thought that it had to be something, I I could do it at least as well as the people I was seeing. So I wanted to learn it. The first thing the person, and it wasn't my manager, because my manager was an engineering VP, couldn't teach me product. So he arranged for somebody who was very good at product to coach me on that. So essentially for all that, I effectively reported to him. And the first thing he did was assess me. And so, you know, the context, I was going to be a product manager for product of software tools for other developers. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing the engineering for tools for other developers for several years. So I really felt like I knew that. And in fact, uh, in terms of a self-assessment, I thought one of my big advantages was knowing my customers. He knew better. And anyway, he, he said, well, that is never true. So I remember he explicitly told me, first of all, that I was not allowed to make a single decision for the product team until after I visited 30 customers. And furthermore, he wanted me to visit 15 in the US and 15 in Europe. And it took a three-week business trip, a pretty you know, nonstop business trip, but I will tell you, it completely changed everything for me. And I, first of all, I immediately realized that I didn't know our customers at all. I was, I was projecting our internal engineers to our customers, yeah. and they were nothing like this. Uh, so I didn't even know what I didn't know. But Other areas, for example, I knew nothing and I knew I didn't know anything about go-to-market. I didn't know how our products at HP were sold. I didn't know how they were marketed. I didn't know all the different roles in an enterprise sale. That was all new to me. And that sales trip was designed to educate me on that. And it really did. Another area that I didn't know, uh, he he had assessed me on the financial analytics So I knew a little bit, like he asked me, I remember this, do you know what LTV stands for? And I said, sure, lifetime value. He said, good. Okay, tell me how that's calculated for your product. (laughs) I was like, I have no idea. You know, I could just guess, but I don't know. Is it one year? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? I don't know. Uh, And is it gross? I mean, who? this was, I knew nothing about this. And then uh, he asked me, do you know what the contribution is for your product? Do you know what the margins are for your product? Do you know the cost structure? Do you know the cost of a sale? And I'm like, oh my God, I know nothing. And I immediately knew I knew nothing. And so he said, well, you really do know nothing. Now, and in fairness, on my defense, I mean, I had, I had a computer science degree. There were zero courses in finance. So I, I didn't pretend that I was some financial genius or anything. So he said, no, here's two things. First of all, I'm going to send you a book on finance for business so that you could learn the basics because you don't even know the basics. And then I'm also going to get a tutor for you in our finance department who is going to tutor you weekly on the analytics. You know, essentially, this was the analytics. This was the data. And he said, just so you know, this is super important because 
pretty soon you are going to have to do what we call the quarterly business review. Yeah. Most products kind of get reviewed by the executive team. And he, I remember he explained to me, said, you know, don't fool yourself. They're not really there to review the product. They're there to review you because they are making a bet on you uh, as the product manager. This is how they know if it's a good bet or a bad bet. And so he said, they're going to be judging you. <laughs> and I was nervous already. So obviously I was really, but you know, he asked, you know, he, I remember he told me, I have a lot of work to do to become a decent product manager. But he said, this is all stuff that you could learn. Anybody can learn this if they're willing to put the effort in. And so he asked me point blank, are you willing to put the effort in? Because he wasn't going to coach me if I wasn't. And I said, absolutely. I want to learn this. I, I, I know that one way or another, I need to learn this stuff. And I did. I mean, I put the time in. And it wasn't that hard. It took a few months of real effort. But look at all those gaps. I had gaps in customer understanding. I had gaps in go-to-market understanding. I had gaps in finance. I had gaps in data analytics. You could really ask, what did I know? <laughs> Not much. But within a few months, I knew what I was talking about. In fact, in that executive review, they asked a whole ton of questions on all kinds of things about our customers, about our data. And I could speak with direct knowledge. I could reference the customers that they knew also. And they knew that I knew about these customer environments. They knew I knew salespeople and what they were struggling with. And they knew that I understood the dimensions of my own product. And so that's what they were looking for. So the point is, there are many ways of assessing What's important is that you as the manager, you assess the way you want to assess, you judge, you figure out where their weak spots are. And in my experience, every single person I have ever met has weak spots. And we all do <laughs> for yes. every job. Mm -hmm. And it's even worth pointing out, even if you were to hire, like, for example, Amazon makes great product people. Even if you hire a product manager from Amazon and you put them on your team, just because they succeeded at Amazon doesn't mean they'll succeed in your company. Definitely. They don't know your customers. They don't know your leadership team. They don't know how decisions are made. They don't know your culture. They don't know your technology stack. They've got some work to do, even though they're awesome at product. And so your job as a manager is to help them get to that level of competence. You talked a lot in the book about product vision product strategy, discovery, and delivery. And a lot of people, uh, the feature factories do delivery. If you think of discovery, it means you're running experiments before you build. A lot of ideas should be killed before they're even born. And there's some lovely stories like Zappos, for example, with that website when they made the shoes and so on. And not made shoes, deliver the shoes. It just proved that people buy shoes online. Lovely little experiments like that. What really struck me was you said, discovery is a set of tactics. And the strategy is really how you deliver that inspiring vision. And it's not a roadmap of features. Right. Can, for, for the listeners out there, what might that look like? What might a good strategy look like? I mean, uh, are there particular tools or is it just a way of thinking? Uh, is it even as simple as the written narrative that you talked about uh, earlier today? Oh, well, those are big topics. Actually, each of those are big topics. Mm. Let me see where, let, where to start. Normally starts with our product vision. Now, mm. in truth, it's, things start at business strategy. It starts in that boardroom with the mm. C-suite, but they will decide things like, do we want to try to sell internationally? Do we want to have a direct sales organization? Stuff like that. Mm. Product vision is where it starts for a product organization. Product vision is somewhere between three and five years out for software, mm. five to 10 years out for devices, but it's, it's the future you are trying to create. That vision is intended to deliver on the business strategy, but the vision is what really attracts good people. I mean, I'm trying not to go down a rat hole here. It takes me an hour to talk about product vision. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. really important tool that, tell, that really serves many purposes. Let me just say it's our number one recruiting tool mm. is a good product vision. Most good product engineers, designers, product managers join a company because they are attracted to the product vision. 
So that is uh, really worth the time. And of course, if some listener is interested in this, the book will go into quite considerable detail. Now, once you have that vision, it doesn't say anything about how you're really going to pull that off over the next several years. That's what product strategy is. Product, product vision you do like once every five years. Product strategy is a living document, a living thing. And a product strategy is about, first of all, it's really kind of got two competing objectives. The first one is deliver that vision. But obviously, we can't go off for five years and come back and say it's done. So the second goal is while meeting the needs of the business as we go. So there's got to be quarterly results as we go towards that strat- that vision. And that's what a product strategy has to do. Now, a product strategy is an even bigger topic than a vision topic. Like, how do you do that? Because a good product strategy is really what lets us get an organization of 50 engineers can outperform an organization of 500 engineers. And by the way, that happens all the time because the difference is those 500 engineer companies are usually feature teams. They have no real product strategy, but that 50 person organization that's got a real product leader that understands product, empowered teams, they're getting much more out of their 50 engineers because they're having them work on the things that are meaningful that will really move the needle for the customers, move the needle for the business. So product strategy, I'll just say it it requires focus. It's where we leverage insights from the data, leverage insights from our customers and insights from the enabling technology, insights from the industry. But we are combining and exploiting these insights in order to decide what are the most important problems that need to be solved. And then that's what we assign to the product teams, problems to solve. Now, it's worth pointing out that product discovery, which is how you solve those problems, product discovery is kind of an irrelevant topic for a feature team organization. What does it mean to have product discovery if you're already given the solution? You've already been given the features to build. And the data. (laughs) <laughs> and the deadline. So there's no discovery. I try to tell people, don't fool yourselves. There's no discovery there. Discovery is only a relevant concept if you're given a problem to solve and the freedom to come up with the best solution. And then discovery is how do we find a solution that's valuable, usable, feasible, viable, like we talked about before. And then once we do have evidence that those are that we have that solution. And mostly we get that evidence, like you said, with a lot of prototyping and a lot of quick testing. We do quick testing with customers. We do them with our stakeholders. We do them with ourselves. We do them with our engineers. But we're doing this testing in order to make sure we have evidence this is worth building. And when it's worth building, then it goes on the product backlog. And then the team, whether they use Scrum or Kanban, is much less important Uh, but they are delivering a product quality implementation of that prototype. And that's really the difference. So it starts with vision. The product strategy is how we decide which problems to solve. Discovery and delivery done by the product teams to discover and then deliver the solutions to those problems. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I hope it was useful. It was fabulous. Thank you so much.